Got it. Okay, welcome. Wednesday, June 23rd, class session, Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations, Delta College. Uh, we were introducing power series solutions last time. Very interesting, but today was not very much effort. We'll show you how to take it to the next level so that you can do it more quickly. So the concept may have impressed you last time, but still seemed like a lot of writing. So we'll see if we can get even lazier. Uh, this is nearing the end of the fifth week and you have one more week left and you know the schedule as you look forward. Uh, I produce a grade report at the end of the week. You know, you handed in one problem last night. I'm, I have it graded and I'll upload it to your folders later, but not with a new grade report. It just added one problem. But you're watching your homework points. Well, of course you're watching your homework points. And remember 120 is the max. 24 problems, five points possible max. So as you drop off the old ones, you know, if you if you add a five and you drop off a two, remember your score increases to by three points. So as you approach 120, you naturally rise more slowly, but you're approaching 120. So look at your grade report and how those 24 best are calculated. Make sure you ask me a question about that if you have a question. So if you hand in a five and your homework score went up by one point, that just means you dropped a four off the other end. That would be wonderful. But so that then you get alarmed that you only raised by one point. That's because you got this max here. Okay, so I'll produce a homework, or I'll produce a grade report after your last homework this week. I'll produce a grade report before you execute the third test and after you execute the third test. Other than that, you can keep track of your own. So what can we say to make power series solutions better? What can we say to make to introduce the pause transform. We're going to have fun with this. Uh, as we take a time out, though, there, uh, you know, as you're working on the other problem, I've had a lot of fun discussions with people about the problem 4324. So these are notes from today's office hours with a couple of different people. And again, I just scribble these notes myself, I don't record what I was saying. So got a lot of strange things written on here. Don't take them at all to be correct. And then there was a discussion of the other problem. Remember, this is just my scribbling. But it gives you an idea of what people were scribbling or asking. I don't think this is an obvious question. I don't think it's a simple question necessarily. And uh, it's why it was the last question in the section. I think he was trying to prepare you in section 4.3 in problems 23 and 24 for the things we're about to do. Problem 24 was preparing you for the underdamped response. Remember section 4.3 was strictly undamped resonance. But they were preparing you in problem 24, I think, for a resonant frequency. So maybe that was the author's intention. Then notice problem 23 right there was preparing you for chapter six. This you know, very nice thought picture he puts up in problem 23, where he says, well, what if you had undamping, but you kept tapping the mass with a hammer at just the right moment? You've done that as you've swung your slinky more and more violently, right? Everybody's got a slinky on their shelf somewhere. They did one time. That uh, you can promote resonance with just this tapping. The, the formal word for that tapping with a hammer, the formal word is impulse. That's like a bat striking a baseball. It's like a lightning striking a circuit. 
lightning bolt striking a circuit, an intense force for a very brief time. The hammer in problem 23 is only in contact with the block for a second. So I, to me, the reason why I asked problem 24, the reason why I ask any question is I'm just curious, I wanna know the answer. And you see part A is his question out of the book. So he believed there might be a qualitative answer. And then I wanted to go one step further and ask the common sense question, because don't tell me you haven't done this. I know you've done this. You're driving through the parking lot going over the speed bumps and somehow you intuitively feel that if you just went a little faster, you kind of like skate over those speed bumps. Is that possible? So when you view these two speed bumps together, you know, you have a feeling for the fact that I could go over them well, or I could go over them badly. I think that's what the question is kind of hinting at. And I don't take any of these numbers for granted. I'm just, just thinking out loud. Uh, what bothers me in this question, and this is probably the last thing I'll share here, is I don't know if I completely understand what the authors meant by more and more violently. I mean, I understand resonance. We understand resonance. But resonance is the case of no damping. Yeah, clearly I could, if I had no shock absorbers on the car, I could make this go, no suspension on the car, I could make this go badly. I could make this go very badly. I could, you know, create resonance probably. But the author clearly says that this is underdamped if we take the authors at their word, which means I have oscillation, but it's being dampened significantly. So again, this is just me spitballing with some other people. Is, you know, where should I go? And how, is it, was he serious? Were they serious when they said more and more violently? I, someone was speculating me, speculating with me, is, is the separation between high and low the violence of the bump? How do you define violence? in this case. So I don't know. I, I just thought it was a fun problem. I want to hear what you have to say. I don't necessarily assume that there's a right answer. But intuitively, I think we probably all agree that there must be an answer, right? If we went out to the parking lot with a bunch of two by fours and did some different experiments at different speeds, and could record a lot of data. Somehow we intuitively feel that we could find a best strategy. And I don't recommend you doing this in somebody else's parking lot, but somehow you feel like they're setting the speed bumps to slow you down. I could find a strategy to uh, defeat that with the right speed. And most speed bumps are not are basically placed ahead of crosswalks, things like that. They're not regularly placed. You do see speed bumps regularly placed on the freeway. For example, if you're driving up to any place on a freeway where they want you to soon stop. So you've experienced this uh, up the Mackinac Bridge. I think I've, you could say this. Any place where they're starting to queue up cars, what do they do? they put a bunch of rumble strips across the lane, not on the side of the lane, put a bunch of rumble strips, a little bit separated, and then, and that gets your attention, boom, 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 boom. And then a little more closer together because you're slowing down. And if you're not slowing down, you're gonna go boom, 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 boom. I don't know how to take you on a field trip, but I, I think you've experienced that before possibly. So I guess these are all things I was thinking about. I don't see people put speed bumps in succession like this, but that's what the author was asking. Okay, those are my thoughts on that. You're welcome to share your thoughts here or elsewhere.
never tried to defeat the speed bumps or never met these rumble strips. <laughs> Never tried to defeat the speed bombs. Oh, okay. See, see, I guess I'm, I guess I. You're living on the edge. I'm a little more, <laughs> I'm a little more edgy probably. Okay, here's the next thing I wanted to show you. And let, and this was, so this is in the category. Now let's get started in the category of could we make the power series solution even more efficient? So let me pull up my notes from last time to, to remind you of where we left off. We had done a problem that looks like this. This paper is separated, come on. There we go. We had done this problem right here where we picked out a mellow damped harmonic oscillator it is definitely underdamped because the spring is much stiffer than this. You do the p squared minus 4q or whatever it turns out to be, right? This is not enough damping to overcome the spring. Now here's a, a simple linear, simple linear driving function. And now, what I'd like to emphasize is two things. This was a lot of writing, really a lot of writing. And you could have the same conversation possibly you did in an algebra class. You know, part of what makes this way too much writing is I kept writing T, 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 right? So I got a way out of that, no problem. But before we do that, I think I'd like to look at these three, four solutions that I wrote here, three different ones. And I also am gonna bring this to you, although I'm not gonna calculate it for you right now. Remember, I can do this the classical way. So I didn't try to scribble this neatly, but I just scribbled out my notes of doing this the classical way, right? Here's my complex eigenvalues or complex characteristic roots. Here's my YH, here's my YP. I could discover the A and B for YP pretty quickly. But the part that causes pain is this awkward complex conjugate pair here. You know, funny exponential, funny angular frequency in here. But you guys are strong, you can work all the numbers out. You can get these goofy numbers here, which is a little bit like what you did on the most recent homework. And now you, know, you wanna ask a question. Is this my fate? Is, is doing every problem like this my fate? Do I really have to slug through the constants like this? Well, Mathematica would slug through these constants very quickly and produce this answer. So, okay, then, then I'm, am I doomed to be the slave of the machine? Do I have to take the machine at its word? But then you compare what you got here, which is an absolutely exact solution. Now you compare it to what we cranked out rather painlessly, somewhat painlessly in the power series solution, right? Constant, constant, constant line parabola, not really a parabola cubic. Now I'm not saying fractions and weird numbers cannot appear here because they can, but usually not irrational numbers. It's not that that can't happen here, but that this methodical one step at a time calculation seemed less painful than this oh, let's massively deal with random numbers work up here. So let's look at this nicely. Let's look at this graphically to make sure you see the purpose. Now back to this paper, to make sure you see the value in these four solutions. And then we'll show you how to make 
this process even more efficiently. Okay, so I will say, let's open up. That's the part where I have to take notes now. So, returning to previous example. And let's open up some images in Mathematica. Previous example was y double prime plus three y prime plus five y's equals t plus two. Kind of a harmless problem. Y of zero was one. Y prime of zero is minus one. But just randomly picking numbers here can promote a real mess. That's why we spend a couple of days putting a four and a three here, right? So let's go to this Mathematica notebook. Forced, damped, harmonic oscillators. So we can actually see some nice images. So what do I have to do? I have to move this to a nicer window. Got to get rid of that. I was also remarking with someone in office hours that I need, I think I need two or three monitors. <laughs> I think that's the way it's got to be for just about everything from now on, right? Let's get up a Mathematica. I'll open it and then share it with you. Four stamped harmonic oscillators, got it, copy, got it, share. Okay, here we are, we're looking at this notebook, size is good. Uh, let's put in this problem, initial conditions one and minus one, position velocity, time, it looks pretty generic, we'll adjust it if we have to. Driving function was t plus two. Now, as some of you are using this notebook and you're digging up errors no problem but send me the notebook then because this notebook is functioning as you've seen us demonstrate so if you got an error when you adjust something you may have a syntax error right let's put a three here let's put a five here no it does take practice and now i gotta see if i gotta restart mathematica No, it doesn't look like it, but am I getting the answer I expected to get right there? That does not look like the answer I expected to get. Because uh, Mathematica hasn't, remember I showed you this trick last time, maybe Mathematica shouldn't be allowed to simplify this. Yes. I will undo that just so you can see it. So beware of machines trying to simplify your life. Here's a solution to the differential equation. That's a goofy constants, I don't know. First, I'll tell Mathematica to expand the solution, multiply it out. And actually that seems to match, I'm checking, that matches exactly what I wrote on the paper, even though this last term is a little bit funnily presented. But you think you're gonna make this better by telling me mathematics can simplify it. It doesn't look that way, right? So I'm sure Mathematica thinks it did you a favor and simplified this, but it does not look simplified to me. So I'm just gonna drop that part off. Okay, so now I got my solution. The goal is to take it down here and put it in my yh, yp. The yp will be the stuff without the oscillation in this case. The yh will be the stuff with the oscillation. I'm not trying to separate this problem into yh and yp. Actually, I'm just interested in their sum and my polynomial approximations but I'm using this notebook that we did before. So if I just do what we did before, there's my YH in blue dying out, 
my YP in black dashed, which is the thing that's imitating the driver. And then the blue plus black dashed is red. Let me put the driver in there to see if we can see that more clearly. Good, do you see that that shows you that my YP does not imitate the driver in slope. It just imitates the driver. The red is imitating the driver that it's a line. That messed up my color coding to add the YP though. Okay, now let's do this. I do not care about YH and YP right here. Let's just dump those two and go to my solution. And that really messes up my color coding. So for a moment, let's turn off the color coding as if I didn't need it. Okay. But now let's add this. Let me see if I can expand this window slightly or reduce this window. There, that's a little more readable. Let's stick in my polynomial approximations. Here was my first most crude polynomial approximation. It was one. Uh, where am I getting my initial conditions? I should have initial conditions of one and minus one, right? This blue thing does not look good. What did we do? I'm going to re-execute them. Remember, we've done this error before, most likely a copy and paste error at the next cell. Got that. Got that. You're missing the 1825th. Yes, I am. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, it was just a copy and paste error. OK. Now let's go back here. Now I feel better. I won't go back to that dash stuff. So do you see what I said about my orange line? You know, my approximate solution is one. Of course, you're laughing at that. You're not very impressed. But you got to say this for me. It is the best constant that meets this problem's conditions. Now I'll pump it up to 1 minus t. That's a little bit better approximation, isn't it? Now I'm approximating the right initial value and the right initial slope. And you could even imagine for a few seconds that that line actually works as a solution for a few four portions of a second. Now let's add the plus zero t squared. Of course, that's not going to help me at all. But we add the plus, what's the next term? Plus t cubed. That's nothing to laugh at right there, right? Let me see if I can bump that up, or let me see if I can reduce my window. I don't need all this time, right? Yeah. For, uh, what's that? For a healthy quarter of a second, you really can't tell the difference between the actual answer and our very inexpensive approximation. Right? Okay, so now we're excited. So I could continue this process. Let's go back to the paper and we'll do some more pictures like this shortly, but we gotta try some harder problems. Yes, now I'm excited that if I continue this process, maybe I could really make some good approximations. Calc two in the sense of power series solutions, you're right. Uh, in fact, uh, it's neither here nor there, but a lot of uh, calculus programs, particularly in high school, throw in slope fields and power series solutions introduced in a calc tube. So let's, how can we improve this? That's what we got to concentrate on. I don't think I'm going to repeat this problem here, right? Because we've done good work here. I want to know what happens if the problem gets nastier because I want to get out of, I want to make sure I destroy any shred in your mind that you could do these problems the old way. Let me show you a problem you couldn't do the old way, you haven't learned how to do yet. And then let's couple it with 
I don't like this, all this writing. Can I minimize my writing? Okay. So now we're gonna go to a more efficient way. on a more difficult problem. Okay, good. Maybe I have to include those pieces of paper in the notes. So let's pump up the difficulty level here. What if I said, well, let's not get exotic or crazy yet. What if I said, instead of a number there, I'll actually put a variable. And then let's put a number here. And uh, what should I put over here? Just some constants maybe, or should I, let's put a more realistic function over here, like maybe. 2e to the minus t. And this will be a good next step. Let's say y of 0 is 1. y prime of 0 is 1. I'm not trying to do any messages. I'm not trying to send any messages with these initial conditions yet. I'm just picking some mellow numbers. So what is more difficult about this? We have never done a problem. See, this is not autonomous anymore. Actually, this problem is dependent on time. The quality of the problem is dependent on time. And if you think of this as a damped harmonic oscillator, possibly, really what I'm saying is as time increases, I'm increasing the damping. So what if instead of a fixed damped harmonic oscillator, fixed damping, what if I had some kind of device that made the damping get greater and greater as time went on? It's just a proof of concept here. So let me show you how we could do this more efficiently. One more time, and this is the, probably the last time I'll ever write all these pieces. Let me write the pieces just so we know we're on the same page. This famous dot, dot, dot. And, in, and you know what's going to happen. You know how to differentiate it. But make sure you respect the pattern that you see here. This is 1a1 plus 2a2t plus 3a3t squared plus, even though I don't have the number written over here, I know the next term is 4a4t cubed. And we also pointed out this next pattern last time. Now, when I differentiate, you know, there's a one power of t, one times two, or I could pronounce it two times one, one times two, two times one. I could pronounce it either way, right? So this becomes two a two, then two times three, is six a three t, and then three times four is twelve a four t squared. And even though I don't have the next term written here, I know this next term is four times five, 20, a five t cubed. I respect the dot, dot, dot. In each case, you can tell me the next term. But what's wasteful here is this constant rewriting of the t's. So let me show you another way, which is, of course, remarkably reminiscent of a spreadsheet. I'm trying to get everything on the screen at the same time, if that's possible. It might be possible for a brief second. OK, good. So now I will write the y, y prime, and y double prime down a column here. But let me make additional columns. You know, here's a row, row, row. 
let me make additional columns. Let's call this the t naught column. T to the naught power, t zero power. Let's call this t to the first column. Let's call this to t to the second column. And then you understand what I will do. I will have as many t columns as I think I need. Uh, I don't know what four dots means. Maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> this saves me actually a lot of writing. Do you, you see? Then I'll represent y as a naught in the t naught column, a one in the t one column, a two, a three, a four. Unless you think that that is a trivial gain, look how it improves the next rows. So now I got my A1. Oh, wait a minute, I made a mistake. There, didn't I make a mistake? I got my A1 here, right? But I need to incorporate the effect of the T. What's the effect of this T right here? I was in such a hurry, I skipped it. Ordinarily, I'd write A1, 2A2, 3A3. I just go happily skipping along. But now you understand what the purpose of this T is or what's the effect of this T. It actually did what? Shifted each of these one step to the right. There's actually nothing there, because after I multiply y prime by t, there's no constant term. Okay, good. And, and you understand if I multiply by y prime by t squared, it would shift it over two steps. Okay, I'm just trying to set up an efficient table. And then here I got my 2a2, and my 6a3, and my 12a4, and my 20 a5 double check that's in the t cube column right 20 a5 t cube good you know the next number here what's the next one right here two times one three times two four times three five times four six times five must be the next one see how easy it is to pick those out once you know the pattern mm -hmm. now let me put this in your mind what if i told you to give me the approximation up to and including the sixth power of t, right? So that means you'd have to name a naught through a six. Do you see from this table now that in order to reach a six, you only have to go to the fourth power of t in this table? So if someone says, give me an approximation up to the sixth degree, well, then you really only have to write, you don't write this table up to the sixth degree, you write this table until you reach a six. <coughs> okay, good. Well, so that's David, one, go ahead. Can I ask a question? You, yep. you multiplied the middle row by the T for the T times Y prime. Yep. But you didn't do anything with the, with the four in front of the Y. Oh, did I screw that up? Let's find out. So you're right, absolutely. And thankfully that's not gonna be a hard fix because we're in a table. Okay, okay. just checking. Yep, no, 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 I'm gonna, I gotta keep focused. Thank you for keeping me focused. So, but everything we said is still good. So this T introduced a new complication for you. Now I'll show you the next complication, this statement. It's not just add all these columns up and get a simple little polynomial here. Remember, two e to the minus t is itself an infinite polynomial. Do you know the power series for two e to the minus t? Well, it's gonna be a requirement now. It's got a t naught piece of t. So how am I gonna? write that for you. Now I'm going to have to totally abandon that previous piece of paper. And I'm going to have to say, remember, 
e to the x is one plus x plus one half x squared plus one sixth x cubed plus uh, two factor or three factor or four factor or one twenty fourth x fourth. I have a feeling, now I can write down more, but I have a feeling I only have to go to the fourth power. And now remember this about power series. Wherever a power series is legitimate, you're allowed to make any substitution in the variable. So to write the power series for two e to the minus t, which is what I need, I'm allowed to do what? I'm allowed to input a minus t for each x I wrote here and I'm allowed to double each term. So let's carefully see what that produces. Two doubling, x is replaced by a minus t, but also doubled. The minus t in here gives me a t squared. Doubling gives me a one. So I'm writing the power series right now for two e to the minus t. And then this produces a minus sign and the two times one six is one third. So this is a skill you have to have from your power series life. Uh, minus t, give me a t fourth. No minus sign, two times that, give me a one twelfth. So now I do know one, two, three, four, five. I do know the first five coefficients that I'll write into here. Two, minus two, one, minus one third and one twelfth. Now I'm ready to do my calculation because above the red bar, these three lines have to add up in each column to these five numbers. And further, if I wanted to go further, but let's just go this far. Let's just go up to A6. Remember, y of zero has to be a naught, and y prime of zero has to be a one. Second degree equation, I have two pieces of data, and they prime the pump. So I already know a naught and a one. Maybe I'll keep a little scoreboard over here to the right. So I've primed the pump, so to speak. And now I'm going to work out all the rest up to A6. Looks like it's a relatively long journey, but it's not going to be too bad if we're organized. So now let me show you the next way to massively organize. Don't throw away the fact that there's a recognizable pattern in each of these rows. Now watch that, that translates and watch carefully my spacing. For a naught plus nothing plus two a two is two. Next row. 4a1, I'm writing this a little bit close together for the camera, but I'm trying to figure it out nicely on the paper. Plus a1, now the second row wakes up. Plus 6a3 equals minus two. Next row, 4a2, or next equation, plus 2a2, plus 12 a4 equals one. And now I'm gonna challenge you because do you see that the patterns that we wrote in these rows are now showing up where? In these columns. Now I'm gonna fully translate to the columns. I'm gonna stop doing the rows. I mean, rows, columns, it doesn't matter which way you organize things. But what I here I'm gonna challenge you is you write down the next row for me. What's well, very clear but the next equation begins for a three. If I doubt that, I can go back up to my table and check. 
But what's this next term right here? Do you remember the pattern? 3A3. Oh yeah, okay, it was 3A3. What's the next pattern right here? Two times one, three times two, four times three, five times four is 20 A4. Now it's a five. Each time increasing, each time increasing, starting different place right here, different time it woke up in this column. The only thing that's not predictable necessarily is this coefficient on the other side, which came from the production of two e to the minus t, minus one third. And I'm just gonna write down the next one, just going, because I need to get up to a6, right? So I know that my next one is a4, five times four, six times five, 30, a6 is one twelfth. So I want you to fully be aware that this pattern is here. My goal, you can stop me if you want to, is you firmly believe you could write 10,000 lines here. You firmly believe you could write the next 10,000 lines because you know the pattern. I'm not gonna ask you to, no, no one's gonna ask you to, but you could ask a machine to write the next 10,000 lines. I 10,000 would be excessive. I think 10 or 20 would be fine. Now, just for your, uh, just for your own personal benefit. When you play this game of writing down these equations right here, these are called recurrence relations. And if you were in a discrete math class, someone would show you techniques for solving exactly recurrence relations. So what we're doing is gonna just write down the first five or six but you could actually, quote unquote, write them all down and find the exact solution sometimes. There's a, there's a caveat there. So uh, maybe some of you are headed for a discrete math class or have taken a discrete math class, then you would study recurrence relations. One of the things you study. But let's just crank out these numbers right here. So one at a time. And I could write down all my work I don't know if I'm gonna write down all my work. Why don't you also possibly just check me? So four on the other side is minus two divided by two, a two is minus one. That's what I believe. And now I'll stick a one in here, minus one. That totals, no, 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 it's a new puppy. So four in here and one in here is five. Throw it to the other side is minus seven. This is where it's gonna to start to get ugly. Minus seven over six. This is where it's gonna to start to get painful. And that's why we're only doing three more. Uh, four times minus one is minus four. Oh, do you see how these columns are combining? See, I didn't even notice that, did it? Aren't these columns combining? Were they really combining? Yes, they were. But do you see this as an illustration? Even though I could have wrote four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow, that would have been more intelligent. I still like this pattern. But do you see this is four A naughts, five A1s, six A2s, seven A3s, eight A4s. Okay, well, let's roll with it. 6A2s is minus six. Toss it on the other side, become a seven. A4 is seven twelfths. You know, the proof is gonna be in our check, in our image. Now we get into fractions. Seven A3s is minus 49 six. So I think I better write this down. Minus 49 over six plus 20 A5s is minus one third, which is minus two over six. So I throw those over the other side. This is 47 over six is 20 A5s. So if we're correct, that's 47 one twentieths. 
you see there is a cost to doing this. At first you're saying, wow, this is just beautiful. I'll just do this all day. But no, there is a cost. On the other hand, a machine wouldn't be afraid of fractions. Probably. Eight A4s. That is 56 over 12. I guess I could cancel. Eight over 12 is two thirds, 14 thirds. Is that right? 56 over 12 is 14 thirds. That is correct. So 14 thirds plus 30 A sixes is 1 twelfth. So I guess I got to convert that to 12s. I guess I didn't need to simplify that, did it? Didn't help me simplifying that. Eight times one fourth was 56 twelves plus 30 A sixes is one twelfth. Toss those on the other side, 30 A sixes is minus 55 twelves, twelves. Divide by, and I'll get to say A six is minus 55 over 360 course, there's a five that simplifies 11 over 72. Now we're going to take this to Mathematica and check how good my picture is. But I'm not going to take it to Mathematica, the four stamped harmonic oscillator problem. And why not? Because this is a new problem. This is like time dependent damping. My other worksheet would not work on this the same way. I'd have to ask Mathematica to do a different thing. So what I'm gonna do is I have a notebook on our website called Series Solutions, where I've prepared it to do these little nastier ones. Let's find it, open it up, and then I'll share it with you. We're doing a good job. We're doing a good job on time. Series solutions, copy. That's not what I wanted to do. So let me put that previous notebook away. Let me got this open. I got it open. But share it with you. I'm sharing it with you. Modify that window. Pump up the words slightly. There. Okay, so now, and you see that I had a different problem primed in there, but you can experiment. Here, I was doing a different problem with somebody perhaps, where my damping depended on a parabola. Excuse me, that would be more complicated. I'll show you how to do that in a second. But let's do our problem. There was just a simple t right there. There was a four there, and there was a, not e to the minus t, but two e to the minus t. Don't erase that initial column. Let me say something about this expression, e to the minus t right there. The, the uh, mathematic is, command for E is exponentiation. Now, I think this is a little bit different maybe than you guys might do it or people might do it in the future. Do you see my problem is I'm a command line dinosaur. All my mathematics, I just type in, what command should I type in? What command should I type in? You can actually choose different input formats in Mathematica that you could type in equations in maybe the more readable form you expect. And Mathematica even allows language input. You could say integrate x squared, just like that. I'm pretty sure that's somewhere, but I've never gone to the trouble of going through the documentation because I'm just stuck in command line purgatory. But here's what I did. I defined a differential equation. Let's set some initial conditions. We had one and one in this problem, right? And then I tell Mathematica, because this is not something that's going to solve exactly. I wrap it in the ND solve, numerical differential equation solver. 
and I assign the word solution to it. So I'm telling Mathematica, go try to solve this problem for me numerically. Uh, it's angry at something. It wanted, oh, it, okay, it wanted my initial conditions to be in a list. I accidentally erased a brace when I altered this function here. The initial conditions should be listed for Mathematica. List in Mathematica means braces. Try again. I'm missing that. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of this worksheet. Here's an error message. Got it. Let's, so I'm, I'm doing a real life situation here. Let's get out of this. David, don't I'm afraid I've messed up the syntax on the machine, right? So I quit Mathematic. I'm going to reopen that notebook. You can do the same. Remember, my notebooks in the Google Drive are open, right? The, the, you can download them, but you can, if you screw one up, you can just go back and uh, download the original version. Let me prep this for you again, slightly bigger type. Okay, ready to share it with you. Okay, let's hope we do it right this time. So I was changing this to a T, that's no problem. I was changing this to two times exponential, that's no problem. I'm gonna erase the three cos part. I have all my braces in the right place. Okay, so this thing I'm gonna, might not have been an error message. It was just Mathematica telling me what it did. Okay, it was trying to help me, that's the problem. Now let's try some basic range here. Notice now, pay attention, the numerical solver I ran from minus five to five. That means if I want a reasonable picture, I can't draw minus five to 10 for time because Mathematica didn't solve the problem after t equals five seconds. So let's just open up a small window here. I'm definitely gonna dump the grid lines garbage. Got that. And now let's put in my polynomials. Now I kind of prepped, and this is a different problem, but let's put in my coefficients as they appear. There was a one and then there was a one plus T. I'm just reading the coefficients. And then there's a one plus T, what's the next one? Minus T squared. I have these commented out. And then there was uh, that, copy paste, eliminate comma minus seven, six T cubed. I hope these coefficients are all right. And then I took that, copy paste. And the T to the fourth coefficient was seven twelfths. See, I got nervous, so I started using parentheses. And here I got that, I don't want the comma. Two more, just be patient because this pre-typing will make it easier for us to look at the thing. Uh, 47 one twentieths. Uh, let me check what it's saying right here, I guess. Oh yes, okay, that would be smarter with that. Yes, thank you, that's true. Okay, but I'm here, so just hang on for a second. That's right, I could just comment out each line. Maybe I'll even do that right now, but first I wanna see if I have all my things in order. Okay, so. There's my 
full six degree estimate. These things right here have been commented out. Good, because I might want to do two of them at the same time. I think that's probably the logic I was doing right there. And my time, let's get rid of the tick marks. I think that was overkill. Let's just hit enter, see what happens. Now I'm ready to compare. I don't think I need these tick marks. I think I know why I was doing them. That doesn't look very good, does it? <laughs> First of all, I gotta figure out which one's red and which one's mine. So we may have some actual work to do. Uh, initial conditions were one and one. So this two does not look good. This one does look good. This looks like a one and one to me. So this tells me that I either have a typo in that problem or I didn't execute this line. I think I've executed this line. Solution plot, polynomial plot. Let's come down here. I'm getting this red thing. Which one is that, the solution or the polynomial? Yes, that's the explanation. Good, thank you. See, the solution is at two, so that means I've got a bad initial condition somewhere right there because I reopened the book. Good, thank you very much, Michael. Okay, now let's get back to it. There's my solution. Now let's start adding polynomials. Let's add the full six degree power. There's my approximation. That's pretty, that's pretty nice, isn't it? Almost for a full one second, plus or minus, this is good. Certainly for a half a second left and right of the origin, you really cannot tell the difference between my approximation and the truth. Now, what if I went total overkill and showed you all approximations at the same time? That's too much trouble, right? But it does make the point that each one of them gets better and better and better, right? What if, we did this, copy, paste, stop, comment out, out. This is the why I made that table like that, isn't it? What I'm gonna do is slowly uncomment this just so you can see the full effect. Probably you think that's a little bit over dramatic the full effect of each one of those. Let me do another shortcut right here. Let me take this command and stick it in here. So every time I execute this, it just re-executes the show command. This is gonna be less writing. Okay, got it. There's my first approximation. Remember what speech is. That is the best constant in the universe that solves my differential equation. Now I take this out, cut, paste, that is the best line in the universe that solves my differential equation. Cut, paste. That's the best parabola in the universe that solves my differential equation. And, and you get the picture right now. There's the best cubic. But I'm just gonna finish it even though we're at break for a dramatic effect. There's the best fourth degree polynomial. Now, by the way, how would I know if I made an error in these coefficients? There's the best fifth degree polynomial. That can be very subtle. So you have to be careful. I have to have some confidence in my coefficients. I, I'm guessing I have some confidence right now, but how do I know the difference between I got a bad coefficient and my approximation stopped working? Because there's no guarantee that my approximation should work forever. Remember, that's what the power series is about. Power series doesn't always represent a function forever. So it could be that minus three quarters to plus three quarters is the best I'm gonna get out of this. I will only know by cranking more coefficients, which we're not gonna do right now. 
But still, in this window, let's run the window minus one to one, zero to two. In that window, that's a darn impressive, that's a darn impressive approximation. Look at that just in that window, minus one to one, zero to two. I guess I didn't do the zero to two very nicely, did I? That's a pretty good approximation for very little effort. But this approximation is kind of a black box. So how do I know if, if I made a mistake, would I be able to see it clearly in my approximation? Well, that's not so obvious. That's why you cannot afford to make a mistake on these coefficients or why you might assign the solving of these coefficients to a machine. And that's not what we're teaching in this class. So just be impressed with what we have here. Be impressed with the added efficiency of this nice table. Be interesting to see, could I then make a Excel spreadsheet out of this? But we're not gonna do that. And remember, you got to remember your old power series tricks, like how to make a new power series out of an old power series. Okay, good. We've gone too far. We've got to take a break right now. So, but this is the time we wanted to spend in Appendix B, just to give you a sample of another way something could be done. I'm going to mute the microphone. I'm going to take a break. We're going to come back at 1.11. And then we're going to open up the last chapter.
Okay, here we go. Uh, I do want to, before we leave this, I do want to point out one way to handle a particular case. And so I'll do that right now, but we won't do another problem. And then we'll go to the next topic. So what I said to you when I opened up that Mathematica notebook is I had another problem pre-prepped. So let me show you how to handle this. What if that would have been one minus T squared in front of the Y prime? And you could even modify the Y. You could modify the Y double prime. You could modify all three. But let's just focus on modifying that. And let's put a two there. What I want to say to you is this is not difficult, but you have to realize you don't have three lines in your table. You have four lines in your table. And so it'll go like this. Y, Y prime, Y prime, Y double prime. And the modifiers will be two, one. Yes, that's not very exciting. Let's make it a four. Four minus T squared and one. We'll leave that one at one. And so now my coefficients, as I read them off, will be a naught, a one, a2, a3, each of those is multiplied by a two. And then, this is y prime, what's the y prime pattern? a1 times four, 2a2 times four, 3a3 times four, 4a4 times four, Don't recommend you doing this in your head, even if you know the pattern. And then here's 1a1 times minus t squared. And the t squared shifts that 1a1 over here with a minus sign in the t squared column. So the effect of the t is to shift. That's going to be an important word to us next week. And the next of this is 2a2, right? 2a2, but it's been shifted with a minus sign. So minus 2a2. So that's how you deal with more trouble here. You just write a line for each one. And that creates a line in your recurrence relations for each one. And what's this one right here? It's a simple 2a2, 6a3, uh, 12a4. 20A5, and so on. So this is how you deal with, if you have extra garbage here, or here, anywhere, don't try to write one line for this. Write two lines for that. OK? OK, good. So that's enough power series stuff to make you dangerous. Okay, now we're gonna open up this famous last topic. Zoom, 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 looking for a healthy pen. One of these is out of ink. Let me find out before I start writing. I guess both of them are out of ink. Yeah. Take them as far as we can. Plus, I think I'm not going to use that one anymore. Okay, this is a new topic. And it's a topic that's kind of like shrouded in magic and things like that. Again, after we start to do it, it's going to be a little bit like the series solution. You're going to say, you can't do that. That's not fair. That's too easy. That's, it's not that it's easy, is it? That's magical. It looks like magic. Right? 
what's the quote from science fiction? Any any uh, any any sufficiently advanced technology looks like must look like magic. Was that Isaac Asimov or something? A Laplace transform is something that solves equations, differential equations automatically, a certain class of differential equations. And, and thankfully, the class that we're most interested in, the linear differential equations. And, and it can do more, but in particular, ones with bizarre forcing functions. So you might call them real life different linear differential equations. But it is an entirely new topic. So you gotta be careful how we introduce this. So on our website, and I will take you to the website for a second. Don't neglect these handouts. So here we are in week five, handouts. Laplace transform handouts, Laplace transform facts, practice solutions. Practice is a kind of a small worksheet with some minor problems on it. And then solutions is the actual written solutions to them. The comparing four methods and Laplace transform trigonometry derivations, that's later. But the prime one right here is this Laplace transform facts. That is very important. So I could pull this up in my browser, but then I have to wait on it, right? So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to already have it on my desktop and share it with you. So when you download that paper, it's going to look like this. Let me pump up the type a little bit. So this is a kind of a one page cheat sheet for the Laplace transform. It goes over the major facts of the Laplace transform. And, and there are other, many other things about the Laplace transform you will learn as you go on. But if, if I had to put it on one page, this would be it. Here's the physical definition of the Laplace transform. Already that looks, you know, busy or threatening. Then here's a famous gallery of Laplace transforms. You know, like here's the Laplace transform hall of fame except it's a very abbreviated Hall of Fame. <laughs> These are some important transforms, but by no means all the important transforms, but they are some important ones. So I, I'm justified to call these famous Laplace transforms. If you're doing this for money, if you're doing this for real, certainly in the old days, you'd have a book on your shelf that might be two inches thick filled with Laplace transforms. Well, you know, old CRC handbooks and stuff like that. Go look at an old CRC handbook and look at the Laplace transform section. I'm sure it's relatively thick. Then famous properties of the Laplace transform. That's what these next three objects are. What makes the Laplace transform so valuable is its linearity. And we've used that word linearity. Now we're going to use it in this context. But if you look at what I mean by linearity, even if you can't decode these symbols yet, it looks like, uh, yeah, the Laplace transform of a sum is the sum of the Laplace transforms. The Laplace transform of a scaling is the scaling of the Laplace transforms. It looks like linearity as if you were doing a derivative or an integral, which it is. Then there's a special superpower of the Laplace transform, and that is what it does to a derivative. And in the first line, it's just what it does to one derivative, but then you could take it to the max and say what it does to any number of derivatives. That whole second line looks much more threatening than it is. It's just a pattern I want you to observe. And the real workhorse among Laplace transforms, one of the other superpowers, you know, the really the thing that really gets work done is called the shifting theorems. Uh, sometimes people call these the first and second shifting theorems. Sometimes people present them in opposite order. I, there's no particular 
rules about which one is which one. People just call them the shifting theorems. Sometimes people call them T-shifting and S-shifting, or shifting in the time domain and shifting in the Laplace domain. And then no, notice I do these Roman numeral one, two, three, probably the most famous superpower of the Laplace transform. It's called the convolution theorem. It's a subject of section six, five. Really, really important and might be able to give you a nice demonstration of that. So you want this handout on your desk. You want this handout printed on your desk, whatever. You know, you could bookmark it, but then you always gotta pull it up, right? You will learn everything stated on this handout. And that is the beginning but that's about what we're doing, which is the beginning. If you go on, you're gonna learn a lot more tricks to do with the Laplace transform in specialized situations. You have other classes possibly where you're gonna use differential equations in the future. But this is our goal. And so what I'm gonna do is I have this piece of paper already printed out because I always just keep a copy on my desk maybe. and. I think what we're gonna do, just to emphasize how we're gonna do this is every time I show you how to do one of these, I'm gonna, we're gonna check it off, circle it, right? So we're gonna accomplish all of this, but it will take us through the end of the next week. So today, I don't think we're gonna accomplish more than the first few up here at the top. But on the positive side, and certainly talk about the linearity and derivative. So some of the early power tricks and some of the early transforms. I still haven't told you what a Laplace transform is, but organize yourself by following this worksheet, uh, by following this handout. That's what I want to say to you. Organize yourself by checking off the things you learn on this handout. Okay, good. So now it's time to say, what is the Laplace transform? And so for a few minutes, for quite a few minutes today, this will be kind of a legal or technical discussion. And hopefully by the end of the day, I can actually get down to demonstrating how it actually solves something, but I'm not gonna make any promises about that. Tomorrow we'll do a lot of demonstrating. First, I have to make you feel what it is. So, it's normal when I approach anything that's absolutely brand new, especially in mathematics, there must be a formal definition. So this is as nicely as I can state the formal definition. Of course, on the paper right here, you have the definition of the Laplace transform, right? But there's no words here, so that's not very helpful. But it is actually the definition, so, so let's state it in English. The Laplace transform of a function it is itself a function. Let's say of a function f of t generic function f of t is itself a function. Now, what notation do people use for this function that's the Laplace transform of a function? They use various notations, but it's not uncommon to see people use f of s and to use the capital F to mean the transform and the lowercase f to mean the function I took the transform of. So I'll write that down. But that doesn't tell you what it is yet. <laughs> to find 
by the improper integral zero to infinity. It's plus infinity, but I'm not gonna make any fuss about plus infinity or infinity. I mean, if I want minus infinity, I'll put a minus sign in front. Sometimes I put a plus sign in front there. F of t e to the minus st dt. That's it. That is the definition of a Laplace transform. It's both mysterious and underwhelming at the same time. Now let's think about this, and then we're going to have to do a sample to make it real to you. But what is a Laplace transform? It's a machine that eats functions and spits out functions. On the paper, I wrote it like this, the Laplace transform of f of t is the integral from zero to infinity f of t e to the minus s t dt. I had a y in place of the f. What letter I use for the function there, it's not important. People often use an uppercase L to indicate Laplace transform. Sometimes people in the old days used a script L, but I don't think that's really important right now. So we'll just use a regular old capital L. But what does it mean? This is the key phrase. The Laplace transform of a function is itself a function. What that means is what? Function in, function out. I feed it a function and I get out a function. The Laplace transform is a function of functions. You've done a lot of functions in your life, but usually it's a function of a number which produces another number, or a function of a vector which produces another number, or a function of a number that produces a vector. Remember in calculus three, real valued function of a real variable, a vector valued function of a real variable, a real valued function of a vector variable, and a vector valued function of a vector variable. You had different things that you, different kind of levels of functions, but they were always numbers in, numbers out. This is function in, function out. In this case, it's very important to recognize that. When we do the example, you'll see that a little more clearly. Because when you look at this thing right here, your first question is, is that a function? So let's go through it really carefully. This actually is a function. It's the function above that I called f of s. Some people write it like this to write Laplace transform. Some people write it like this. This has the advantage of warning you that I'm performing a Laplace transform. This has the advantage of reminding you that it's a function and displaying the variable. So what do I mean by displaying the variable? Well, if this is a function, your first question is a function of what variable? It's, it's not a function, it's an integral. But if you take apart the integral, what do you get? Say f, f is the variable? No, f is the input. t is a variable? No, t is the variable of integration, the dummy variable, right? Is e the variable? No, e is that funny Euler's number, 2.71828. Etc. When you look at this integral, the only letter that's not accounted for is S. And by saying it's not accounted, I mean this, S can vary. Nothing else in this formula can vary, right? The T can't vary. The T is, in calculus, you called it what? A dummy variable or a variable of integration. What do you mean by dummy variable? That it's not doing anything. It's like in the old days, it, trains had dummy engines, right? You saw a train with four or five engines at the front, maybe only two of them were pulling. Dummy variable just means this letter T 
could be changed to any letter. It wouldn't change the problem, right? Zero to one, x squared dx is one third. And zero to one, q squared dq is one third. That's the x or the q is called the dummy variable, the variable integration. So t is not a variable, f is not a variable in this integral, it's the function that I inserted. E and D are just, E is Euler's number, D is a notation. Now the only thing that can vary in this integral is the S. So this is a function of variable S as we displayed over here. Now that still doesn't help you too much because you're saying, well, what kind of a function is it? So it's time to do a demo. So let's do, and I think I want a new sheet of paper to do this demo, because I don't have lots and lots of room at the bottom of the sheet of paper. Let's do a demo and take the Laplace transform. So this is an example of the function e to the 3t. I'm just pick a generic function and a function that's valuable to us. We use lots of exponentials in this class. Let's try, what does Laplace transform do to this function? I know very well what this function looks like. What does Laplace transform do to it? When I pull out my definition, zero to infinity, I'm emphasizing the input e to the three t with color for a second, but in a few minutes, I'll stop doing that. So that's the raw definition. And this is very much like, I want to draw this analogy to you. It's very much like the day you learned how to differentiate, right? What was the definition of a derivative? It was that silly limit with a difference quotient, really irritating limit with a difference quotient. And someone said, this is the derivative, you have to do this. But pretty soon they admitted to you that real people don't use the difference quotient every day. They've developed a long list of rules for derivatives. This is gonna be the way it is with us. I have to show you what a Laplace transform is, so I have to use the definition, I have no choice. But after a while, I'll show you how to develop a list of rules for a Laplace transform. But we had to learn where the rice came from. Now, what's, going to go on with this integral. This does not look too bad. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous about the infinity thing, but we can deal with that. I remember how it dealt with infinity in an integral before. What I did is took the integral from zero to a number like n and then said, let's let the n get really large. That's the definition of an improper integral, right? Now let's look inside here at our integral. Exponentials are not hard to differentiate or integrate, right? So I'm not feeling too bad. Uh, I've got two exponentials, right? But common base, add the exponent. So why don't I do that? Now you say, whoa, whoa you, you did something, you skipped something. I did legally skip something. But let's check this out. If I add the exponents, I get 3t minus st. Or if I wrote it in reverse, st plus 3t. Or if I factored out the t, negative s plus 3. Or if I factored out the minus sign in the front and the t in the back, s minus three. So this is the proper combination of those two. It just wrote it in a way that was useful to me. I'm gonna write it in a way that's useful to me. Okay, now what's our plan? Our plan is, can we integrate? Can we insert the limits? Can we tell what happens when this upper limit gets huge? The integrating is not a big deal.
there, that is where this came from. I mean, literally, because if you differentiate this with respect to T, what happens? By chain rule, a minus S minus three comes down. That would kill this minus one over S minus three. That would give me just this exponential, right? In common language, if I told you to integrate e to the seven t, you would write one seventh e to the seven t plus c, right? Okay, but first of all, I'm doing a definite integral, so there's no constant I need to write down. The limits will take care of that. But the important part is I undid the chain rule when I differentiate a seven come down up front. So that means when I integrate, what should I differentiate to get this? I put a one seventh there to meet that seven. Now just pretend that this negative S minus three quantity was the seven. That's the integral, not hard. Now I have to do the limit thing. I'm gonna do this carefully. Remember, I'm integrating respect to t, so the limits are t equals zero to t equals n. Right, I've got so many letters here, I might put the zero and the n in the wrong place. So let's make sure I'm integrating respect to t. And then if we survive that, let's let the n get super huge. I like the plus infinity there. In general, I guess I do like to write plus infinity. Okay, now let's put in these n and zero. Again, that's just a basic substitution. So that's not threatening. It goes in place of the n. So that's minus one or s minus three. It goes in place of the t, excuse me. e to the minus s minus three n. And then I put in the zero and I subtract. But I get a break when I put in the zero. I put in the zero, this becomes zero exponent becomes zero, e to zero is one. So I just got this fraction out front. But remember, I'm subtracting that fraction. So it's gonna be minus negative or plus one over s minus three. Because t equals zero turns this exponential into a one. Okay, good. So we're making progress. Now the question is, can I let n get super huge? Uh, the answer is yes and no. You got to be careful what we do next. And that is your first inclination is to say, of course I can let the n get super huge because a negative exponential, when the n gets super huge, this piece gets super small. You're thinking of classical negative exponential. As that variable gets larger, this whole thing becomes so close to zero that it disappears in the limit. Ah, but what's the catch? That is, if this is a negative exponent in the exponential, right? You don't see the number there. There's no number here, right? This is a variable. So actually, if you choose S badly, you're in trouble. What if S is negative one? Then you actually have negative four here, which becomes a positive four, which means as N goes to infinity, you actually go the other way. So what do I need to make sure that this exponent stays negative? The N is a positive number going to positive infinity. The minus one in front is definitely negative. What I need to keep this whole person up here negative is to say s minus three is a positive number. Could I get away with s minus three being zero? Well, I don't even wanna talk about that right now. Let's just say this will be okay. If s minus three is positive. Or you could say it like this way. If s is bigger than three. So if S is bigger than three, then as this goes to infinity, this disappears. And the limit will be zero. Now what happens to this term as N goes to infinity? Well, actually nothing, there's no N involved. 
plus one over s minus three. And now I'm done. There's the function. One over s minus three. Let me write that in a compact line so that you can focus on it. The Laplace transform of e to the three t is one over s minus three. That's the compact version. Legally, I have to say s is bigger than three. I don't want you to worry about this yet, but legally I do have to say that right now. Let's go back to our worksheet. And I see that right there. So you've just done your first Laplace transform. Okay. You've tested the definition. You've done a Laplace transform. You got many more to do, but I promise you they accelerate. After we learn a few rules, you start to knock these out very fast. But at least you learned what the Laplace transform was. The Laplace transform took a function, which was e to the 3t. It's about like that. And it turned it into another function. Be very careful that only is bigger than three. One over S minus three looks like this. This is what the Laplace transform did. So the Laplace transform is something that eats functions and spits out functions. You could call it a function of functions. But that's a little too Zen-like for most mathematicians. So mathematicians tend to use the word like an operator, operator, or some people say a transformation. And that's where the Laplace transform gets its name. It's called the Laplace transform. It transforms functions into other functions. Okay, good. What does this have to do with differential equations? We don't know yet. But I'll, I'll make you this promise, that if I patiently and correctly apply the definition to every one of these things, I would produce these formulas. So for right now, I'll let you take these formulas as true, even though you haven't proven them. Remember, if I told you to prove that the derivative of sine was cosine, you'd have to do a little work, right? I imagine you could do it, but more likely you just take the derivative of sine as cosine on faith. And so you can do that with these theorems, with these famous Laplace transforms. I rather want to talk about these two tricks. and what Laplace transform does to a derivative. And I may just have enough time to do that. By the way, notice that the role of the three, the three didn't do anything for me, right? So really what I've just shown you is that the Laplace transform of e to the at is one over s minus a. The three did not influence my work, as long as s is greater than a. It really was just a placeholder, a parameter, right? So you've actually got infinitely many Laplace transforms now under your belt, one for every a. So now what would happen if I told you to do this? What's the Laplace transform of three e to the four t minus 12 e to the negative? T. Well, you could go to the definition and insert this function and slug through the definition. But I don't recommend that. And, and why do I not recommend that? Because 
you already know that inside an integral, you're allowed to separate pieces and integrate them separately. And you're allowed to pull out constants and integrate them. So I could literally write this as three e to the minus st e4 t dt minus 12 e to the minus t e to the minus st dt. And why would I redo these integrals if I've already done them? So do you see what we just said? If I have to do the Laplace transform of a string of things, I have a powerful tool from integration called linearity that I'm allowed to break things up and factor out constants. I'm allowed to take this and break things up and factor out constants. And that just means I look up the Laplace transform of e to the 4t, 1 over s minus 4, multiply by 3. I look up the definition or the Laplace transform of e to the minus t, 1 over s plus 1, and multiply by minus 12. I don't want you to go too far in simplifying these. Uh, you know, I could write minus 12 over s plus 1. Be careful what you do with minus signs. And I could even bring these together with common denominators. Really, it doesn't pay off to do that all the time. So don't oversimplify this. Don't build one ugly looking fraction. I'd rather know these pieces. But this is a powerful trick, linearity. It says the Laplace transform of C f of t plus d g of t can always be pulled apart. So I can do the Laplace transform of individual pieces. OK, that's a very powerful trick. Uh, we got time for one more trick. I just showed you this trick right here. Actually, I combined them into one trick, which you often do when you differentiate or integrate. This is the key trick. Nothing I've said so far has anything to do with differential equations, right? It's actually an integral. But this is the first formula on the paper that says the Laplace transform can eat derivatives. and return the original function. That's a powerful trick. Let's do it. So this is called, what does Laplace transform do to a derivative? This is all we're going to be able to accomplish today, but it's a lot. And it'll set us up. So can I show you this formula? Actually, I can show you this formula relatively quickly. It goes like this. I will apply the definition because at least on the first day here, it's the only weapon I have. So I will integrate zero to infinity, y prime, e to the minus st, dt. Actually, I intended those to be in a different color, right? I don't have to write the of t here, right? I, I, if you want me to, I'll write it, but I just, I don't want to overfill this space anyway. So now I got the same problem, right? I know how to deal with zero to infinity, but I have to integrate this first. So the zero to infinity mess, I'll do in a second. That will be meaningless if I can't integrate this. And I'll wake up this thing from your long lost past. What is it called? Integration by parts. You know, integral of 
u dv is uv minus integral v du. It's a way of turning an integral inside out so you could properly integrate it. Or you can integrate something that appears to be difficult to integrate otherwise. So you make little choices right here. And you know, there's various rules for making these choices. And most often it was like hunt and guess. But oh, let's try this. E to the minus st is really easy to differentiate. Well, I'll try that. Actually, y prime is easy to integrate. Because if someone says, where does y prime come from? You say, it came from y. Now remember, I'm integrating and differentiating with respect to t. So if u is e to the minus st, then du dt is s e to the minus st. Now do you gotta be careful with that. Is there a minus sign somewhere? I think there is, so let's keep it. And if u is e to the minus st, this y prime dt is what becomes the y. Okay, let's insert. And let's just take a minute. So be patient. It's just about done. Then we won't have to do it again. That's the reward. So instead of this integral u dv here, this is the u, this is the dv. I'm going to write u times v, which is y e minus st, subtract integral, 0 to n v du, which was y du minus s e minus s t dt. Notice the limits of zero to n, I have to apply to the integral. I actually legally have to apply them to this piece that came out of the integral. So two more lines and we're done. So here, when I put in the n and zero, what I get is y to the n, or y of n, excuse me, e to the minus s n. And I put in zero and subtract. Y of zero, e to the minus s zero, but that's a one. So y to the zero times one, subtract. So that's that piece. What is this piece? Well, to notice, if I take minus minus, remember factor out the minus, I'm allowed to factor a constant of an integral, that's a plus what? A plus what? In fact, I'm allowed to even factor out the s. With respect to t, I'm integrating, so that s is just a constant. I can write the s out front. Now, what does that look like? That looks like, after I apply the limit, the Laplace transform of y. So now check this out. Well, when I apply the limit, let's see what happens. When I let n go to infinity, this becomes the Laplace transform of y. When I let n go to infinity, nothing happens to the y at zero. Oh, don't forget that s right there. That's really important. Sorry, I moved the paper up. There's an s right there, then the Laplace transform. This, what happens is n goes to infinity to this piece right here. That's just a constant, minus y at zero. What happens to this piece as n goes to infinity? Again, s has to be a positive number or my exponential will go the wrong way. So as long as s is positive, this exponential is heading to zero. Now you could say, well, couldn't this person get large and overpower it? Legally, yes, 
but that's not going to be an issue for us in our problems. So why don't remember e to the minus s, x, every exponential is pretty powerful, but I can always find a function more powerful than the exponential. But for a moment, let's assume that this function is not more powerful, that this function defeats that function. This function goes to zero, kills that function. This piece goes to zero. And so now I'm left with the Laplace transform of y prime of t is the same as the Laplace transform of y of t times s minus y at zero. And that's going to allow me to solve differential equations. Let me say it like this, which is a good English sentence where we'll stop and a good way to remember it. The Laplace transform of a derivative is the same as the Laplace transform of the original function, almost, two adjustments. First, I have to multiply by s. And second, I have to pay for it with the value of y at zero. In other words, a derivative on the left is worth an s on the right. And I have to pay for this privilege. For the privilege of turning differentiation into multiplication, I pay with the value of this function at that point. I pay with this initial condition. Now, we're going to tell you tomorrow, we'll do some actual examples of doing this to show you what this means. But this means that I can use the Laplace transform to eat differential equations and spit out the original function. OK, this is a good thing for today. It's, it's this remaining thing right here. Let's not worry about it. We'll show you that tomorrow when it comes up. You will need a little more than what I showed you in blue to do your homework problem for tomorrow night, but we'll give you plenty of examples tomorrow. So I'm gonna end the recording. Thank goodness I started the recording.